All right, good morning, besides Las Vegas. Hang on, I've got a script. So, good morning slash afternoon. And welcome to B-Sides, Las Vegas. Proving ground? Underground? We're proving ground this morning, I feel. With something. Okay. Um, welcome. Do you want to come and grab a seat? We are live on the internet. Please keep your clothes on. Please, really do that. It's early and I've only just eaten. Okay, so we're opening proceedings today with a man who is a pun. Not actually a pun, that's a pun. I'm a, I'm a You're a man that's a pun. Yes. Hey, well, I was going to make up a fun fact about Ian Deason, but he's... You are the fun fact. I'm already fun, so... You are very fun. You're coming a little bit to the mic, just a little bit. Then, um, cool, cool. So, your talk is... Well, it's on the screen, but for those of you who'd like me to read it, the birds, the bees, and the CVEs. So, a um, quick couple of things. Got to thank the sponsors, because they're amazing. Diamond sponsor, Adobe, gold sponsors. Uh, Prisma Cloud, Semgrep, Blue, Blue Cat, Let's Try, Tweet, Duck to One. I was only supposed to say three of these, but thank you to all of them. Uh, it's their support, along with the other sponsors, donors, and volunteers that make this event possible. Um, please turn your phones off. It's just kind of polite. Um, and we're not underground, so I think you can, you can take photos. You're right with photos. Um, but please just don't take photos of random people without asking them. Ian, are you good to go, my friend? Yeah, Excellent. Go. Over to you. All right, thank you so much for that fantastic introduction. So again, the title of my talk is The Birds, the Bees, and the CVEs, or Understanding Critical Vulnerabilities to Critical Infrastructure. Um, my name is Ian Deason, so I'm with the United States Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. Um, specifically, why this is for the birds, the bees, and the CVEs is because when a security researcher and a product security team love or hate each other that much, that is how a CVE is born. Um, you may be noticing throughout my presentation, there are many, many stork images where in other terms, a stork is what delivers babies. And this way, um, work at SZA a little bit acts like the stork where we're delivering CVEs. So a little bit about me. So who am I? So I'm Ian Deason. Um, I'm a vulnerability analyst that specializes in the coordination and the responsible and reasonable disclosure of industrial control systems and other vulnerabilities that affect critical infrastructure. Um, I'm also currently serving in a the Imagination Fellowship, um, which is a leadership development program within my agency. Um, and that is the name of the agency that I work at, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, also known as CISA. All right, so first I'm gonna go ahead and talk a little about why am I, why am I here talking about vulnerability disclosure? Um, so within this talk, I really could have talked about how CISA's mission is to reduce the number of vulnerabilities to critical, critical infrastructure and to the federal government. I could be also talking about how we're going to be trying to engage with different stakeholders to be able to get rapid information out to different stakeholders. But I'm primarily here going to be talking about vulnerability disclosure as well as coordinated vulnerability disclosure. And I've got a few open answered open-ended questions on why. So when I originally looked at in textbooks and certifications trying to find more information on vulnerability disclosure, guess what I found? Nothing. When I went and I actually gave a presentation to some of some students about this particular, like, how are CVEs born? What did I learn? Nothing. They didn't know a thing. What about even before I started, I've been within this role for about three years now, what did I know about coordination, vulnerability disclosure? How does this process work? Did I know? Nothing. So really quick, if someone has a couple quick answers, why, why do you think the government discloses vulnerabilities? Just quick, raise a hand, Bueller, yep. So, so we can't use it, all right. Yeah, so, yeah, so you can't use them anymore. Who, who, who just said that and was right? And just one, one more, just one more. Who was that? Yep. Is he? Yeah, so that's actually another way. So um, and if you can be able to get a lovely st sticker package, thank yeah. you so much. Who was that? That was you, they got um, Merry Christmas. So one thing that's important on why we're trying to, so my take as well, is one of the reasons why we want to make sure that we disclose vulnerabilities. We want to make sure they're public so people can understand what the risk is of these specific vulnerabilities. If things re remain behind paywalls or if they're not disclosed, guess what? The vulnerability still exists. Just because there isn't a CVE ID or a CBSS score associated with it still means the vulnerability is still there. Um, also, one of Scissor's responsibilities is that we are actually a CVE numbering authority. So we will have more responsibilities over industrial control system, medical devices, and federal, federal networks. Um, so a few things just to kind of set up the backdrop a little bit. So there is a specific 
definition of, what, of how the U.S. government sees what a vulnerability is. I'm not going to read it. I assume most folks can be able to read this. Um, also, if you were here yesterday, so Josh Corman's talked about pres Presidential Policy Directive 21 a little bit. These are some of the authorities that we have to be able to work with in critical infrastructure and federal government on how we're able to manage the risk and strengthen the resilience of nation's infrastructure. We're able to reduce vulnerabilities and be able to hasten response. So I'm gonna talk a little bit specifically within the context of vulnerability disclosure on how we're able to hasten that response. Um, so there's different ISO standards. So this is a very, a bird's eye view, if you will, of some of the, of how we are able to conduct our processes. There's ISO standards behind this. The CERT, CERT Coordination Center has written a fantastic guide, but this is a very quick, quick and dirty for those folks that might not have heard this before. Um, so the, the first phase, is this is where there's going to be the vulnerability that's discovered, whether it's by accident, whether it's through research, either way, that information is there. There's some sort of we, there is some sort of weakness to that particular software or hardware that's documented and is shared. Um, so that would be where we'd go into the coordinated disclosure phase. Um, and at that point, we need to, there's a validation of that vulnerability, whether one researcher finds it in an isolated environment needs to go to that product security team to make sure that, yes, they are seeing what is true. Yes, this is truly a vulnerability. Um, one of the things behind that coordination as well is um, a lot of times it's not a handshake. Um, a lot of times people are reaching out with a hand and they're getting a lot, they're trying, they're getting threatened with a lawsuit. Um, so this is a little bit of reality. Some of what CISA does in our mission is we are able to be a third party vulnerability disclosure entity what that means is if you, people need help, we are able to assist. Um, and one thing as well, specifically within this, this phase is the timeline can vary drastically, where some of the cases I've specifically supported have had timelines of about a year to two years where some are within 30 days. Um, so ultimately, once there is some sort of agreement between the two entities or three entities, there's going to be some sort of patch or mitigation phase. So a patch, depending on the system, so if we're talking critical infrastructure control systems, that patch cycle is gonna take a little bit longer because they're not gonna be having on a rolling basis. Some patch cycles are, ha are happening quarterly. Sometimes you need to be able to bring site on staff on site. Some of these systems are underwater. Some of them are in outer space. So it's really, you have to be able to do a little bit more coordination. You have to prepare a little bit better. Also, when it comes to the mitigation phase, not all mitigations, um, not all patches will be a mitigation. Some mitigations are destroy the device, buy a new one. The firmware is broken. So there's other things people need to understand. And then finally, for the last phase, this is something that we're, this is where we become instrumental is where we're using our megaphone and we're able to get the word out. We are able to get the word out to people that might not have access to a threat intel platform. We're able to get that information out to people that need to understand the risk of what their products are so they can be able to make those decisions to how to be able to best safeguard their communities, how to best be able to safeguard their enterprise. Whatever type of operation they are trying to, to have, we are there to be able to support them. Um, one of my takes when it comes to the whole idea of coordinated vulnerability disclosure, there's a sense where there is coordination involved with yes, with, with all of them, but not all of them are organized. So we try to make sure that we're bringing that reasonableness and that organization that it needs. So a little bit high level on the process, but like, why does this become so difficult? So that was, was a pretty easy, well, it wasn't really a flow chart, but it's very, why does this become so difficult and why does this become so critical where I want you to kind of think of criticality, not necessarily as whether something can be remotely ex exploited, whether it's a, a CVSS score of a 10, but think of criticality as critical thinking. How much time do you need to think about these problems? How much, how much creative thinking do you need to be able to, you need to be able to do when you're tackling some of these problems? Um, because one of the things I'm going to be doing is there are five different examples that I'm going to be sharing with you. And in each example, I'm gonna tell you the fact that you can't really have a, a set playbook for everything. 
you need to be able to um, be creative and you have to be able to think on the fly. All right, so I'm going to have a quick example of what if there is a vulnerability that gets shared with you and it's literally everywhere. So this was an advisory that we, that we released um, about a year and a half ago. Um, when we first received this report, the idea behind it was this was going to affect billions of different devices. So this is going to be affecting different real-time operating systems or RTOSs, which are used in cyber physical systems. Some of these products you can see right here, um, or can't really see, but some of the products were products made and maintained by Amazon, which one of the largest companies on, on the planet, where others were smaller projects managed by one to two people. Um, and this becomes very difficult because if you're thinking of a specific vulnerability that affects a memory allocation function in this number of operating systems, are we going to be targeting that operating system during the mitigation and patching phase? You have to be targeting where those actual products are placed. You have to be able to work downstream. So when we started our coordination, we contacted the vendors of these different technologies. Not all of them um, were based in the United States. They're all, all across the world. And it became really clear that there was a lack of supply chain visibility that really came behind this. Because what happens is if you have this small RTOS that is put into a smaller component, which then gets integrated into a larger product, which then gets sold to a system integrator that you know, will create an HVAC unit or something that gets integrated into a submarine, that gets sold and then there's a maintenance contract that's put on top of that. So there's layers and layers and layers of obfuscation of where you're trying to understand and enumerate what the problem is behind one vulnerability it becomes near impossible where not all of these things are gonna be IP based. You can't search on Shodan for some of these things because a littoral ship isn't necessarily gonna have this type of, it's not gonna be able to show this. There is market data that you can purchase, but unfortunately it tends to be really expensive. And if you're trying to be able to just simply understand what the what that impact of the vulnerability is, it can take lots of time, effort, and a lot of thinking. Um, this specific case actually took us an, over a year from the moment that we received the case to the moment that it went public. Um, and one of the things behind it where people start to get a little bit, when it's starting to affect OT, IOT, industrial, medical, and enterprise networks, when it is so many different devices, it gets very difficult to understand what it works with. Um, Specifically at CISA, we are working with um, initiatives within SBOM and another initiative called VEX to kind of help with some of these issues. So I'm not gonna get into that within the this talk, but there are very smart individuals we have at our organization that can speak to that. Um, second one I'm gonna bring up is what if this a vulnerability specifically gets attention? So in this case, so this is another advisory we wrote for a product called the MyCodas MV7200, which is a GPS tracker. So this particular GPS tracker is an aftermarket automotive part that you're able to put into your car and you can be able to track some fuel, you can track where the, the car is, it gets integrated within uh, the, the greater vehicle itself. Um, when we first received this case, didn't see it, you know, it, was, it was bad, but it, the use case behind it, there wasn't the proof of concept available at a specific car. So it wasn't going to be at the level of other other particular car hacks that we've seen where they're able to physically stop a car driving on the road. Um, however, this got a little bit more spun up when the Associated Press picked it up. So what this means for those folks that don't under, that have not seen this before, when the, the Associated Press acts as a larger, a larger seed where smaller news outlets can be able to take the, the information behind it. Um, what specifically happened with this one, and it, you might be able to see what the title of researchers Chinese made GPS trackers are highly vulnerable. That's not gonna be telling the whole story behind you know, what, what is actually capable of this vulnerability. They're seeing the fact that there is to, in another country that is able to try, hack into GPS systems. Um, one of the things I've specifically learned with this case is the fact that there is a Many times security research companies, and this isn't for any of them, 
for or for all of them, but they're able to hire uh, PR firms to be able to do media pushes. And this is where there's this context behind where a vulnerability tends to get more attention if it's able to get more clicks. So that's just an interesting way to be able to take where the research is being, the fantastic research is being done, but it, sometimes there's, that message becomes a little bit different. Um, and specifically with this one, there were, um, I did receive lots of different questions from private industry and other parts of government to say, how many cars can be hacked right now? Which I was not able to answer. All right, here's another, here's another one, which we heard a little bit yesterday. Um, like, what if there's a vulnerability within medical devices? So this can be touchy for some people. Um, so this was a medical advisory. I don't know how many people have heard of the Hamilton T1. Um, some people know what this is because this is a ventilator. Um, another thing I wanna show is the fact, the date is February 16th, 2021, which was right in the middle of the pandemic. So again, this is a vulnerability that, if you look at, so CVS, uh, CVSS, you know, take it or leave it. However, a very, very low, not a very critical vulnerability, but the fact that this was a vulnerability affecting ventilators during the pandemic, where there's supply chain shortages and it's a literal physical harm type of element behind it, people are a little bit more cautious of these type of vulnerabilities. Um, so this was something we did get a little bit more questions on just based off of like the type of technology and how it was affected. One of the things that we have to be able to help with these types of vulnerabilities is we do have a memorandum of understanding in place with our partners at the Food and Drug Administration, also within the US federal government, where we are able to share our vulnerabilities before they're public with the people that know how to fix them. So what that means is they have different capabilities, whether it's cardiologists, whether it's other people that can test these medical devices, which are meant to treat or diagnose diseases or injuries, they're able to go in and give that proper patient safety impact that we can't be able to do because I, I don't have a medical background. I'm not the best person to be able to make that assessment. All right, one of my, another vulnerability that we have is what if it's affecting an open standard? Um, so this was a, I had, to, I had to look up this vulnerability before I, um, before I took this case. Um, so the object management group has something called the distributed data systems, which, so this is a middleware component that's going to be used to handle the reliability of control systems over wide distances. So it's a very, it's just kind of a way to link different architectures. Um, so it's a little bit different because um, there's already this idea of different locations and this is an open standard. How do you be able to fix something when it's you're not telling one manufacturer, you're not telling one software developer, here's the bug, how do you fix it? You have to talk to consortium. And people have been working on this standard for years to be able to build other technologies. So we did what we did. We ended up writing an advisory behind it. Um, but one of the secondary impacts behind this was not only did it affect multiple different technologies, but the fact that if you did a very quick online search, you could see that there's very, very highly critical pieces of critical infrastructure, whether it is a large dam that's up in the United States, or the fact that it's the International Space Station happens to be using this type of technology. So this is going back to this idea of, even if this is a very niche technology only a few people understand, the fact that it's used in very highly critical systems is going to give this a little bit more attention. And so as the, my last example, so like gave different examples of the news, we've given different examples, but what if it all happens at, all at once with exploitation? Um, so yeah, we, get, we have that one. We have log for shell that happened, um, which for many, many instances, not only is it critical on the fact that it was mass exploitation affecting all, all realms of enterprise as well as critical infrastructure. This also happened during the holiday season where many people happen to have time off. This is also during the surge of Omicron virus during, or the Omicron variant of COVID, which also hindered teams. Um, this was also used in open source, which just also made it difficult. But I will say after working with several different teams on the response effort, it was a fantastic job and there's certainly a lot of lessons learned. 
Um, so we've learned a little bit now. So vulnerabilities can really be anywhere. They can affect up to billions of devices. So one CVE could be up to like billions. Um, the media can be able to give attention to things that might normally not have gotten that same attention. Um, the public can be very sensitive to medical devices or things that they understand, such as cars, vehicles, things that they know, tangible items, you know how to express harm. Um, standards can really, really increase the amount of complexity when it comes to response and it all can happen at once. Um, so what are some things that we can be able to do to help? Um, so I'm going to talk about three different strategies here and some of these things we were discussed yesterday where you can be able to add a vulnerability disclosure a vulnerability disclosure policy, you can either become a CV numbering authority or you can be able to have kind of tailor made vulnerability response processes. Um, so if you do make products, so if you are making code that's being sold, one of the things that we highly do recommend is that you become a CVE numbering authority. So what that's going to do is that's going to be able to allow you to assign your own CVE IDs. It's gonna also allow you to be able to tailor what your language is so that way when you're trying to be able to own that vulnerability information, own the rhetoric behind it, this is the first step. They do have a few, few different barriers of entries of making sure that you have a public, that you're showing your publicly facing vulnerability information, which already is something we're already wanting people to do. And it also is showing the fact that you're, you have a, vulner, a vulnerability disclosure policy allowing good faith researchers to reach out to be able to, to provide these services to people, to the company, because oftentimes if it's not explicitly known, organizations and researchers reach out to us to be able to serve as that in, in intermediary. Um, CISA, we are able to help with that. Um, Julia's in the audience as well, so in the, she can also be able to assist you if you have more questions on that. Um, but also something that I had, highlighted earlier, if you do have a business, have a vulnerability disclosure policy, because that's gonna be one of those things to allow good faith researchers to allow this, this work to be done. If you do make those, if you do have those, if you do have those website misconfigurations, it's going to be more, it's gonna be more helpful to have people being, reaching out under, um, with the, People are going to be more willing to work with you if they know that they have that there rather than what you know the byproduct is where if there's some sort of exploitation that can happen. Um, that is something also we can be able to help you with at CISA. Um, and also if you do have if you do have vulnerability response within your within your vulnerability management program, have different plans whether you're receiving a pre-disclosure vulnerability whether you're receiving a zero day, whether if something is exploited, have different plans and playbooks for each. So one of the things behind it is think about, about driving what the consequen consequences based analysis is. So if you do have if you do have those cyber physical systems, if you do have medical within your networks, think about what those worst case scenarios could be. Think about like how if there was the adversary that did happen to that did breach your network. What are those different things you could be able to do? Brainstorm those type of ideas, write them down, and then think about them and be able to make risk-based decisions when that happens. Um, but ultimately, um, one of the things I want people to understand is the fact that not every vulnerability is the same, and you should be prepared because there's a huge data management problem behind vulnerabilities and we, at says we do have the known exploit vulnerabilities catalog to be able to help with kind of that data management problem. But there is understanding the, the depth and breadth of different systems and the different, as there is an interoperability of cyber and physical systems, just have a very good idea of how things can be affecting other, other processes. Um, but again, as I mentioned earlier, um, this seems daunting. Um, we can help. Yes, the, those are those are two storks giving a high five. Um, that, there's an email there if you if you want to reach out. We're definitely able to reach out, or feel free to reach out afterwards. Also, for those of you in the audience, we are actively hiring. Um, so this is a just a pitch. If folk, you can be able to take a picture if you're. We have specific job announcements for um, for Black Hat DefCon and B Side. So feel free to check that out. 
Um, but yeah, that is all that I have. I have. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to the Proving Grounds. Thank you to my mentor, Mainframe. Thank you for um, the organization for bringing me out here. And hopefully everyone was able to take something back with them, bring it to your organization. But thank you again. Well, thank you all. No, well, there we are. Hello. Uh, that was amazing. Really good and excellent keeping to time as well. <laughs> so not that it's up to me, but I think you can come back at some point. Oh. <laughs> it was so good. Awesome. awesome. One more round of, round of applause, please, because that was awesome.